under his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torch light of knowledge, while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So, what I'd like to speak about today is uh, the glorious appearance of Lord Nishinga Day, whose appearance day, everyone can be quiet, please, whose appearance day was last Friday. So I think it's important that we speak about him. I had several other topics I was going to speak about, like Star Wars and its relationship to Krishna consciousness, but I'm not going to speak about that tonight. Because <laughs> I know you're all innocent Hare Krishnas here who have never seen any of his movies. <laughs> so I don't want to pollute your mind. So. But it's a very interesting presentation. Perhaps I'll do it some other time. How I'll, I'll tell you briefly what it was <laughs> so you can understand that I'm not completely in Maya. Uh, what it is is showing how that all these modern movies, including Star Wars, are actually taken from the Vedic literatures. For example, in Star Wars, you have a big monkey character. Does anyone know his name? <laughs> Chewbacca. And in the Ramayana, you have who? Hanuman. And you have a princess. What was the princess's name? Leia and Sita. And then you also have a coronation at the end, and you have an army of, of bears who help. And so basically, it's the same story that's taken from the Vedic literatures, which the author George Lucas uh, studied with Joseph Campbell, who studied the Vedic literatures for many years. And that's all I'm going to tell you right now. So that's a topic for another day when you have more liberal people in the temple room. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about <laughs> Lord Nishingadev and the reason for his appearance. And why he appears, his own personal reasons for appearing, and then as far as we're concerned, why he appears. And I'll start telling an interesting story that has just occurred to me uh, several weeks ago, I was in the country called Fiji. Many of you don't know where Fiji is. It's in the South Pacific. And I'm in charge of the Krishna Conscious Movement there and some other places in the world. So they have this very big uh, deity of Lord Nishingadev there. Now, for those of you who don't know who Lord Nishingadev is, he's the half-man, half-lion incarnation of Krishna. And if you don't know who Krishna is, he's God. <laughs> and so you may ask, why is God looking like a half man, half lion? And we'll explain why. Actually, Krishna has many incarnations in every species of life. Generally, those of you from India are aware of the Dasha avatars, you know, the ten main incarnations like Lord Buddha, uh, Varaha, Vishringa, etc., Ram. Uh, Balaram, Haladara, Rupa, like that. But Krishna has infinite numbers of incarnations. It's described like the waves of the ocean. There's so many waves in the ocean. So that's how many incarnations of Krishna there are. In fact, Krishna's incarnation as Sesha Nag, who is the bed upon which Lord Vishnu rests, and he has unlimited heads, he cannot even describe an end to all of Krishna's incarnations. And for those of you who don't believe that, too bad. So for those of you who don't believe it, that's the nature of God. He's unlimited. Unlimitedly great, unlimitedly powerful, unlimitedly strong, unlimitedly intelligent, unlimitedly renounced. That's why he's called Bhagavan. So Krishna appears as Lord Nusingadev. So I was in Fiji, getting back to the story. And there's this big deity of Lord Nusingadev right after he killed the demon Haranyakashipu. And he killed the demon Haranyakashipu by tearing out his intestines. Now that's a very gruesome thing, isn't it? I mean, not many of you, unless you happen to be doctors, have seen intestines outside your body. And he's wearing a garland of intestines. So into the temple, comes this tourist from the UK. So everybody knows where the UK is? It's part of the EU. 
So the tourist and his wife come into the temple. First thing they see is the deity of Lord Nasimhadev. And they say, oh my God. And I said, yes, it's God. So, <laughs> what is that? And so I was thinking, how to explain Lord Nasimhadev very quickly so they don't run out the door of the temple thinking that the same thing will happen to them. So how do we explain very quickly to them so they understand? So Krishna gave me the intelligence. He, and what I said was, this man who was just killed was a child abuser. <laughs> True. Harani Kashifu was a child abuser. And he's getting justice. And I said, yes, that's very good. <laughs> so Krishna saved me from a very difficult explanation at that point. So why does God come? So let's ask that question first. From God's perspective. Okay. So we understand that God, Krishna, Ram, Yusringa, all names are the same person as the um, uh, it's stated in the Brahma Samhita, Advaita Chuta Nadiranatu Rupam. God has many forms, but he's the same person. And he comes in different places, times, circumstances, yugas, which means ages. So, what is God's psychology? Anybody a psychologist here? No. So, you know that we all have a psychology. And generally, our psychology is shaped by what happened to us when we were children. So what is God's psychology? Why does he do what he does? Let's look at it from God's perspective, or God's angle of vision. And there's one answer to that question. There's three letters, F-U-N, fun. <laughs> because God, Krishna, doesn't have to do anything. We have to do things. Like all of you, or many of you, have to work a job to support your families. And if you don't do that, there's no food. Right? And then you won't pay the rent, you won't pay the mortgage on your house. You'll lose everything. But Krishna is not like that. In the Bhagavatam it's described, he is optakama. Optakama means whatever he wants, he gets immediately. He's swarat, independent. He doesn't need anyone else. Just like there's an interesting story in the Bhagavatam where Indra came to try to trick Krishna in one of his incarnations as Nara Narayan Rishi. He brought a very beautiful girl there. And Nara Narayan Rishi, that is Krishna, he just produced another beautiful girl like this. That was Urbis, for those of you who know the Vedic literatures. So he's independent. Whatever he wants, he gets immediately. He doesn't have to wait. He doesn't have to ask anyone to do it. As described, Paraksha Shaktir Vividaiva Shuyatesh Vavavaki Gilat Yana Balakriyacha. He has many energies, and all of his energies will do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Wouldn't that be nice to have servants like that? Like, Gopinath, he's my disciple, but he doesn't always do what I want when I want. <laughs> he's usually, yes, but. <laughs> so, but God's energies are not yes, but. God's energies are yes, sir. <laughs> so, anyway, so he gets whatever he wants. So, he comes down, whatever he does, he does for fun. I'll give you a practical example. Once upon a time, another gentleman from the UK walked into a Hindu center. And in the Hindu center, there were various deities. There was a deity of Ganesh, Shivji, Durga, many, many different deities. Even Mahavir was there. And, so he, and there's also a deity of Krishna, Radha. And so this Englishman, first time he had ever been into a Hindu temple, he looked around, and then he pointed it to Radha and Krishna, and he said, oh, there's God. <laughs> and the Pujari didn't even know who was God. But he, <laughs> the Pujari said, why do you think he's God? 
And the man answered, because everybody else is working, he's just enjoying with his girlfriend. <laughs> you understand? So Ganeshji is writing, Lukshiva is meditating, Durga's there on a tigress. But he's just with his girlfriend. So he must be God. So uh, Krishna does everything for his enjoyment. That's the only reason Krishna does things. So he comes down to the earth planet as Lord Nursingadev to enjoy. So you may say, what kind of enjoyment is that? Well, I'll explain. In the spiritual world, there's five different relationships that people have with God. These relationships are, I'll give the Sanskrit first, and then I'll explain in English what it means. There's Shantaras, Dasharas, Sakyaras, Vatsalyaras, and Maturyaras. That means relationship of just passive adoration towards God, passive worship. There's a relationship of serving God. There's a relationship of being the friend of God. There's a relationship of being the parent of God, like the Shodamai. There's the relationship of being the lover of God, like Shrimati Radharani, the gopis, etc. So these are five what's called rasas, or tastes of relationships. Some of you may know about this. In this world, we have the same thing. Did you know that? We have these different relationships here. The relationships we have in this world are reflections of the relationships that are there in the spiritual world. The spiritual world, where God is the center, is full of relationships and full of happiness. And in this world, this world is full of temporary unhappiness and ignorance. That's the opposite of Satchitananda, for those of you who know a little Sanskrit. So therefore, uh, Krishna enjoys those relationships, these five relationships. But there are other relationships too, apart from those five, that flavor the five. There are seven of them. They're called indirect rasas. Those of you who study rasa theology, it's very interesting. This information is given to us by Lord Chaitanya's associates, which are called the Six Goswamis of Vrindavan. They talk about this with rasa theology, or the godly uh, relationships that are there. Mm. Just like we may have, let's give you a practical example. We may have a relationship with someone as our father. But then sometimes we may like to wrestle with our father, right? Have some other flavor in that relationship. Sometimes we may like to play chess, just like when I was young. I would play chess with my father. Everybody knows what chess is? Competitive, you know, and sometimes I would win. Very nice. So, even I was with one of my disciples the other day and I challenged him to a chess game. Because it was, a, it was interesting to have competition and anger. You know, when you play these games, sometimes there's anger. Just like, like right now, isn't there some ice hockey championship going on? Is everybody aware of that? And when you watch it, what do you experience? Sometimes anger, don't you? But it's enjoyable. You're thinking, oh, get them. Get the other team. Hit them with a stick or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I've never watched ice hockey, but I just heard from some of our devotees who were just completely absorbed in it. <laughs> Even Madhuri Leela there. She's 81 years old and she's absorbed in ice hockey. <laughs> so there's enjoyment there. So there's enjoyment. What is the enjoyment? There's sometimes there's anger, chivalry, humor, even ghastliness. <coughs> I mean, what happens during ice hockey sometimes if someone is knocked down or something like that? So you're all enjoying these things. I don't, but anyway, and you're all enjoying them. <laughs> You know, anyway, all I know is the Canadian team is one of the best ice hockey teams. <laughs> I know, you all become my enemy after this. <laughs> 
every day. So anyway, so so what happens is that you're enjoying what's called indirect process. There's humor. And so guess what? God likes to enjoy those things too. That may appear incredible. Why doesn't God just sit on his throne and behave himself? <laughs> Isn't it? You know, he's up there in the spiritual world. His business is simply to judge us, to give us fun, to provide everything, you know, Om Jaya Jagadisha Hari, Swami Jaya you know, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Or uh, Satya Narayan Kata. So his, his business is to give us happiness. But he has his own life. And he likes to enjoy. So he's there in the spiritual world. Okay. And in the spiritual world, a lot of these things are not fully manifest. Like, you can't really have ghastliness or uh, anger, too much anger in the spiritual world. Uh, for example, if I wanted to have a fight with one of you, which I know, I would ask you to step outside the temple room. Like someone made me really angry and say, okay, let's go outside and have a talk. We wouldn't do it in front of the deities. So Krishna in the spiritual world doesn't have like serious fights. So he comes to this world and he has serious fights to enjoy. But when he comes to this world, he doesn't fight with any regular person. He has his devotee come to this world to fight with him. So that's the whole story of Hiranya Kashipu. Hiranya Kashipu and Hiranyaksha and uh, Dandavakra Sukhipal <laughs> and our friends uh, and our friends from the Ramayana, Ravana and Kumbhakarna. Everybody knows them? Ravan. Actually, the character in Star Wars that played Ravan was Darth Vader. So, <laughs> Just give you a little hint of what I was talking about. So, so Ravan, they are all incarnations of Krishna's devotees. Because Krishna wanted to fight with them. What happened is that they are generally the doorkeepers to the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, they need doorkeepers. Because if someone's not qualified, they can't enter the spiritual world. The qualification of going to the spiritual world is you have to have no other attachment other than serving Krishna. So they serve as the doorkeepers to the seventh gate of the spiritual world. Just like even in Christian theology, they talk about the seven gates of heaven. Have you heard about that before? But, so there's seven gates to Vaikuntha. So they're guarding the place. And Krishna wants them to come down to the material world. So he arranges this very nice encounter so they get cursed to come to the material world. What is that encounter? Four little boys come. They're called the four Kumaras. And these four Kumaras, they want to go to the spiritual world. And they're pure, completely pure. They're not quite devotees yet, but they're pure. They don't have any material desires. They're what we call Brahmavadis. So they come to the doorway of the spiritual world and they say, we want to go in. And Jaya and Vijay, the guards, they say, no, you can't come in. And these boys, they're very powerful Brahmanas. They have this thing called Brahma Tejas, which means the power of a Brahman. A Brahman is so powerful that if he curses you, you're cursed. And a Brahmana is so powerful that if a Brahmin marries a Rakshasa, then they have, they have the most powerful Rakshasa imaginable. That's how Ravana was born. Ravana's mother, for those of you who don't know Ravana, he was a demon. But Ravana's mother was Kekasi, and his father was a Brahmin, Vishrava. And so you got a, the most worst combination imaginable. A Brahmin, Rakshasa. Very, very powerful. So, anyway, so these Brahmanas, they got, the four Brahmanas, remember, I was talking about the Kumaras, they got very angry at uh, Jayan Vijay, and they cursed them. You're acting like demons. Go down to the earth planet. So then Lord Vishnu comes out at this point, God comes out, and he 
when he tries to see what's happening. At the same time, the Kumaras, who are not quite yet pure devotees, are able to see him and smell the Tulsi leaves and flowers at his feet, and they become pure devotees. And Lord Vishnu was very concerned with the two devotees who have gotten cursed, Jai and Vijay. And he says, what can we do? I can't stop the curse, but let's try to make a little deal here. So instead of going down and staying in the material world, because the material world is kind of an interesting place. You know, it's birth, death, disease, and old age. It makes it quite interesting, doesn't it? And if we didn't have that, it would be fun. So instead of going down eternally and staying in the material world, I give you an option, he said to the uh, Jaya and Vijay, the two personalities. You could go down and spend seven births as devotees, or three births as demons. And so they were thinking, we want to come back as soon as possible. So let's be demons for three births. And so that's why you have this, you know, Ravana Kumbhakarna, Shishapal Dantavakra, and Haranyaksha, and Haranyakashi Pu. So those are the three births of the three, two personalities. So then, this was Lord Vishnu's plan. He wanted them to come down. Because Lord Vishnu doesn't like to fight with a regular demon. It's boring. He has other people to fight with demons, like Durga. She takes care of all the demons very nicely. <coughs> She's quite competent. She has this trident. And all the demons get pierced with her trident. So what, what is that time factor takes care of all the demons? Everybody gets killed by the time factor. So why does Krishna have to come down and take care of it? But he liked, there's one demon that tried to fight with Krishna, and Krishna refused. This demon Kalyavana. Very interesting demon. Krishna didn't want to fight with him. He was just a dirty old demon. <laughs> so Krishna ran away from him. And Krishna arranged that his devotee, Muchukunda, would kill him because Muchukunda was sleeping and he got the benediction that whoever woke him up would be born, burned to ashes. So there was a whole trick anyway. So he burned him to ashes. So Krishna wants to fight with his devotees. It's like you like to play with your friends. You don't like to play with strangers. So therefore, they were sent down to become these two demons, or six demons, actually. So let's talk about Harani Kashipu, who was one of the demons who was killed by Lord Nusingadev. So Harani Kashipu's brother was Haranyaksha. Actually, Haranyaksha means gold eye. And Harani Kashipu means gold bed. It's something like, I don't know if you've ever seen some of these movies, Goldfinger, things like that. <laughs> so these are names of demons. So he liked opulence and soft life and enjoying like this. So Haranyaksha and Haranyakashipu, they were brothers. And uh, they're both the sons of Kashapa and Ditsi. I'm not going to tell that story, how they got to be the sons. But in any case, Haranyaksha was killed first by Lord Boar, one of the many incarnations of the Lord who appeared like a big boar. That means a pig with a big tusk on it. Pretty interesting. Like I said, God is not boring. I wouldn't have joined a, a movement where people worship boring God. A God that just sat there all the time judging people. Isn't that what a boring life that would be? Who would want to be God? People putting their requests in all the time. Isn't it? People praying, dear God, give me this, dear God, give me that. I mean, God, he's getting all these texts on his mobile phone all the time about people's requests. It's a boring job. So, even though the Maya bodies, they like to be God. So, uh, so anyway, anyway, so, Hiran Yachin is killed by Lord Bor. The big pig with the tusk incarnation. And Hiranya Kashibu gets so upset that his brother has been killed by the Supreme Lord, who he understands is Vishnu, that he makes a vow to become so powerful that nobody can defeat him. So he stands on his toes for thousands of years. Eventually, Lord Brahma comes, one of the demigods, and says, what do you want? 
And the Ranya Kashipu, he says, I want to become immortal. I want to live forever. And Lord Brahma says, I can't do that. Because I'm not immortal, I can't do that. But you can choose the way you can die. And he says, well, let's make a deal. I won't be killed by man or beast or inside or outside or weapons or day or night. And he thought he had tricked Lord Brahma to get immortality. So then he becomes very, very powerful, takes over the heavenly planets. And in the meantime, while he was meditating, his little son, uh, Pallad, was in the womb of his wife, that's Kayadu, and his son was taken to the ashram of Narada Muni. Does everybody know who Narada Muni is? Narada Muni is a great sage, great personality, and he has an ashram in, uh, right near Govardhan Hill. It's called Narada Kund. That's where he went. So, uh, this son of Pallad Maharaj, son of uh, Hranikashipu, who was in the womb of his mother, Kayadu, he was hearing Krishna Kata even within the womb of his mother. And by hearing about Krishna, he became a great devotee. So later on, when he came back to his father, no longer with his mother, he was a devotee, he wasn't a demon. And so that's a problem. When you're a devotee, you want to have a devotee child. <laughs> Let's say if you're a devotee and your son comes back from school and he comes back uh, with a, with a, after having stopped at McDonald's <laughs> for a hamburger or something like that, it's quite upsetting, isn't it? You want your son to be a good devotee. And so if you're a demon, you want your father to take up the family business, the demon business. <laughs> it's like if you're a doctor, you want your child to be a doctor. Not natural. So Hiranya Kashipu was confronted with his son who wasn't a devotee. But he thought, let me take my, send my son to a demon school where he learns to be a big demon. And so his demon school was headed up by two nice teachers. Their names were Sanda and Amarka. You don't have to remember the names. And they tried to teach him about friends and enemies, because that's generally what it, how a demon thinks. He's a politician. <laughs> friends and enemies, you know. How to get rid of your enemies. And there's different ways to get rid of enemies. I can teach you them. So you can learn. In case some of you were demons, uh, you can learn how to get rid of people you don't like. The first method is you speak sweetly to them. You say, oh, you're so nice. I like you. <laughs> and behind your back, you're <coughs> crossing your fingers, of course. <laughs> and then another way is you give them a bribe. That works in India. <laughs> it's like many times, many times I'm in, I spend a lot of time in India. One time I was in India, and we had a big bus of devotees on tour. I think you were there, Gopi not. And we wanted to go somewhere where the bus was not permitted. And so the police were stopping us. And I said, all right. Go out and offer him a hundred rupees. And over a hundred rupees, and the police said, okay, go wherever you like. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a second method of taking care, a bribe. Another method is called give someone a position. Let's say if someone is your enemy, you say, okay, you can be the temple vice president. <laughs> that way, as uh, Actually, Chanaka Pandit says, keep your friends close and keep your enemies even closer. That's Niti Shastra. Keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. Anyway, so then another method is divide and conquer. As you tell one enemy one thing, you, like you say, oh, you go to your enemy's enemy and say, he's saying this about you, he really hates you. And then you go to your enemy and you say about your enemy's enemy, he really hates you, and you get them both fighting with each other. And it works really well. That's divide and conquer. Another method of taking care of your enemies is to threaten them. Another method is beat them. But anyway, it's called argumentum ad vacuum. So Pallad Maharaj rejected that because he was a Vaishnava. He loved everybody. A Vaishnava has the quality of a, a jata shatrava, which means his enemy is never born. Like those of you who know the Mahabharata, uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj was a Jata Shatru, means the person who had no enemies. So sometimes he wasn't so good at fighting because of that. <coughs> but Arjuna and Bhim Singh, they had enemies. 
So, not Bhishma, Bhim Sen. No. Corrected this translation. So, uh, so anyway, so Pallad uh, uh, Maharaj rejected that. Then his father asked him, his father said, my dear son, what is the best thing you're learning in school? And he said, dear dad, I learned that you should renounce this demon business and go to the forest. <laughs> his father didn't like it very much. So his father sent him back to school. He sent to his teachers, you know, teach him the right thing. Went back to school. And then the father later on said, what is the best thing you've learned? And he said, well, the best thing I've learned is to hear and chant about Krishna. Uh, Vishnu, who is the father's enemy. And so the father got so angry, he said, try to kill him in different ways. He threw him off a cliff. He put poison in his food. Uh, and even had a very interesting way of trying to kill him. His father had a sister named Holika. Those of you who you know who I'm talking about. And she couldn't be burnt. She had a benediction from the demigods. And so she sat in a fire with Pallad, this little boy, trying to burn him. And guess what? She got burnt. And Pallad Maharaj, he came out of the fire unhurt. And the first thing he said when he came out of the fire, he said, I was very worried about my aunt. I was praying for her. This is the compassion of the devotee. So the father got so upset, eventually he sends him back to school. And then when he goes back to school, he waits till his teachers are out of the room and teaches them all to chant Hare Krishna, all the other students to chant Hare Krishna. This is really too much. And then he teaches his students, to the other fellow students, about his past, how he got association with Narada Muni, how he became a devotee. And so eventually the teachers come back in, take him to the father. Haranya Kashyap, I'm telling the story very quickly, of course. And Haranya Kashyap, he asks, uh, where is your God? You feel you're so powerful. And he eventually says, God is everywhere, which is true. Krishna is in everyone's heart. Krishna is in every atom. Krishna is on the altar. Everywhere. <coughs> Sarvatika. And so then his father, Renikashipu, gets so angry that he takes a sword. If he's everywhere, then I'm going to kill him because he's in the pillar and he, kill, he hits the pillar. And out comes this half-man, half-lion incarnation of Krishna. Fights with Hiranyakashipu. He doesn't just kill him immediately. Because he wants to enjoy the fight. Just like you like the ice hockey. Ice hockey is a perverted reflection of Hiranyakashipu fighting with Lord Shikadev. <laughs> That's why I don't watch ice hockey, because I like to watch Lord Shikadev better. It's much more interesting. Everything we see here is a reflection of the spiritual world. The Bhagavad Gita describes in the 15th chapter how this world is like the reflection of a banyan tree on a bank of a body of water. In other words, the tree has its roots up and branches down. So in this way, everything that's there in this world is also in the spiritual world. Just like I mentioned before, you see any films any, any uh, movies, <coughs> they're all reflections of stories that are actually happening in Krishna's pastimes. I mean, let's mention, for those of you from India, you know about Bollywood films? Bollywood films? Generally, in the Bollywood films, there's a man and a woman who fall in love, and then there's a whole circle of dancers that go around him. So that's a perverted reflection of Krishna's Rasalila in the spiritual world. Because there's Krishna and Radha, there's Rasalila. So, anyway, so Lord Nusingade, getting back to the story, is playing with Hiranyakashipu. They're having to fight back and forth. Sometimes it appears like Hiranyakashipu is winning. He's not actually. But Lord Nusingade a lot because he enjoys this like back and forth competition. Chivalry, that's another indirect rasa. Anger, he's very angry. And then finally he places Hiranyakashipu in the doorway, which is neither inside or outside, neither day or night because it happens to be dusk, and without weapons, using his nails, he bifurcates uh, and takes out the intestines, and he kills Hiranyi Kashyapu, but then he's still angry that he's killing all the other demons that happen to be there. You know, he just 
And everybody's so afraid of his anger. When God gets angry, it's pretty intense. He's so angry that even the demigods, like Brahma, Shiva, and even Lakshmi, even though she recognizes that's her husband, but she doesn't want to go near her husband when he's angry. <coughs> I've actually seen that sometimes that when someone's husband gets really angry, the wife says, you know, I'm not going to talk to him now. Even in this world, it happens. So, Lord Nishigane was so angry that everybody's afraid of going, someone has to pacify him. So then they take this little boy, Pallad Maharaj, Hrani Kashyapu's uh, son, and they put him in front of Lord Nishigane. And Lord Nishigane immediately becomes pacified. And he puts Pallad Maharaj on his lap and he starts to lick him. And he enjoys this rasa of love, like it's a parental type of thing. Because we often talk about God the Father. So he, he licks them like a cat, because he's half man, half lion. So he licks them like a cat, and it expresses his emotion and love for Prahlad Maharaj. Actually, God loves all of us. Krishna loves all of us in that same way. He wants us to be with him. Sometimes he's waiting for us to come back to him. And when we finally come back to him, he, he faints in ecstasy, being so happy that we're back with him. That story is there in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita. That's Sanatana Kumar. Sanatana Kumar. Sanatana Goswami. So, Sanatana Goswami. So, so anyway, so what happens is that Lord Jesus' name is pacified, and then he says to Pulak Maharaj, you know, basically, I love you so much, ask anything you want, you can have from me. And Pulak Maharaj says, no, I'm not a Vaniya, I'm not a, a businessman. I, I'm anyone who approaches you to ask something as a businessman. He said, I simply am your servant, and that's all I have. And then finally, he does ask Lord Nishingadev for something. Something very interesting. He asks Lord Nishingadev to forgive his father. So this is the compassion of a great devotee. Please forgive him. And Lord Nishingadev says, yes, I forgive him. And I will forgive 21 generations of your family backwards and forwards, you know, future and past. And not only that, I will not kill any of your family members from now on. So Pallad Maharaj had a grandchild and a great-grandchild who were acting demoniacally in the beginning, but the Lord didn't kill them. Does anyone know their names? What was Pallad Maharaj's grandchild name? Vali, great-grandchild. Nobody knows. Banasura. Banasura. And the Lord, when he appeared in his various incarnations, like his uh, Krishna or Bhamana Dev, they didn't he didn't kill. He forgave them and engaged them in his service. So this is quite a wonderful story. So <coughs> hearing this story, okay. So we explain why North Lord Nishingadev came down for his own enjoyment. To have these indirect rasas to have to fight, to enjoy the chivalry, to enjoy the anger. And so, what does it mean for us from our particular point of view? Because by hearing about Krishna's pastimes, whether we're talking about the pastimes of Krishna in Braj, Vrindavan, or Lord Nusingadev, or Kurma, or any of the incarnations of Krishna, we become so attracted that we lose our taste for these things of this world. Krishna the Gita talks about something called a higher taste. He says, Raso Varjam Raso Pirsha Param Drishta Vivar to take. So spiritual life is so attractive, so pleasant, so wonderful. In fact, a pure devotee has spiritual TV built into his heart. He can tune in to any of these pastimes. In other words, let's say tonight, let's say if Gopinath was a pure devotee, he could just think, I want to watch the Ramayan tonight. And then he just looks in his heart, and there is Ram, Lachman, Park, Chaturna, Sita, Hanuman, and he's in ecstasy. So that, that would be nice, isn't it? So that's, that's really the goal of Krishna consciousness, to see the Lord's pastimes in one's heart. But right now we hear, and we see the pastimes of the Lord through the process of hearing. Shushu, Shosh, Shradhanasya, Vasudeva, Shan Mahat Sevi Punya Tirtan Shemana. 
So by hearing these pastimes, we become attracted. And also hearing these pastimes, we realize that the Lord is always protecting us. Now sometimes, this is a subject matter of another class, which I'm not going to get into now, but sometimes the Lord, mostly the Lord waits to the last minute to protect us. <laughs> like in the case of Rukmini, Pallad Maharaj, uh, Subhadra, there's always a last minute save. So there's a reason for that. Uh, that's to bring his devotee closer to him. And to spice up his pastimes. Like we were talking about the seven indirect rasas. This, these are like, for those of you from India, garam masala. <laughs> Hot spices. Because without spicing your vegetables, they don't have much taste. Like Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master, one time said, when they were giving him just boiled vegetables, he said, let the starvation committee go to hell. <laughs> he said, we should eat tasty food. Because they were trying to protect Srila Prabhupada's health. But Srila Prabhupada said, we want to eat something that's tasty. So you have these five direct rasas, but they are flavored by the indirect, the seven indirect rasas. And that makes the pastimes even more tasty for the devotees and for Krishna. And then we're assured of Krishna's protection, like a Krishna Rakshamam, Pani Mam. And so we pray like this for Krishna's protection, and we pray to Lord Nusingadev, whose deity you see on the altar. We pray to Lord Nusingadev to protect us, to protect the movement, and ultimately, we have something like Karanyakashipu in our own hearts. What do I mean? Uh, lust, anger, greed, illusion, envy, these are all qualities that are demoniac. So we all have little Karanyakashipus living in our hearts. Not literally, but figuratively. So we pray to Lord Nusingadev to go into our hearts and eradicate these impurities. So this is the meaning of Lord Nusingadev's appearance. So thank you very much. So any questions, quick questions or comments about anything I may have said? Yeah. Is uh, the, the past experiences of, of that you are talking about, is it the same concept as samskara? Samskara means the past. That's an interesting word. The word samskara means different things. But generally, it means impressions that one has gotten through the past, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, in the Vedic tradition, there are things called samskaras. If that's what I meant, samskara. where Where you do different things to give good impressions to people. For example, there's the birth ceremony. There's the uh, antiation, the death ceremony. Uh, there's the griha pravesh ceremony, where you first go into a house. So there, you're... There are different ceremonies to give good impressions in the heart to people, to help people dedicate themselves uh, to the spiritual goal, to clean up some of the bad samskaras. Because we all have some bad impressions from past lives that are present in a subtle body. And so generally, the best method to cleanse the heart is what? Do you know the best method? Chanting. Cheto dharpanam arjanam bhava mahadvarni. They're all for them. <coughs> Cleanse the heart of all the dirt that's accumulated. So that's that's to me that's the best samskar. So whenever we do other samskars, we always add chanting hard Krishna. Like you have a griha pravesh, antiyeti, means the funeral ceremony. We have uh, or namakarana. We always have uh, chanting hard Krishna. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Nice question. Any other questions? Yes. Why is why is Krishna always waiting to the last minute to uh, save the devotees? That's a subject matter for another class. Oh. <laughs> I'd be here for another hour talking about that, but it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's no uh, demons in the spiritual world. I was wondering uh, what makes the material world so disqualified that the uh, demons appear here and Krishna has to come and kill them. And at the same time, material world is so qualified that the Krishna place is trying to pass times. Yes. Because the material world is a place also of Krishna's pastimes. It's also Krishna's arrangement. That the material world will be here. Of course, there, there's a bunch of rascals who populate the material world like us. <laughs> so there's no lack of people in the world. It's not that Krishna always has to send people. 
uh, to the material world, but there are plenty of people here already. Um, in the spiritual world, they don't have demons, but they have a, rumors that their demons are there. And also, sometimes the devotee makes believe he's a demon for a little while, but there's no killing or anything like that. Uh, in one book by Sanatana Goswami, the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, it's described that sometimes a devotee acts as, let's say, the Kaliya <coughs> serpent. You know the Kaliya serpent? And in the spiritual world, Krishna gets on the back of the Kaliya serpent, not only dances, but rides the Kaliya serpent around the Yamuna like one rides on jet skis. <laughs> Do you know, everyone knows what a jet ski is? So he has fun. Or the Keshi demon, someone makes believe he's the Keshi demon in the spiritual world, and Krishna just rides on his back and gives everybody horseback rides. On it. So it's a little bit different. So these are all parts of Krishna's pastimes. Krishna's the enjoyer. Whatever he does, he enjoys. You can't question him. Why do you enjoy making so miserable here in the material world, Krishna? He doesn't enjoy making it miserable for you, but he makes it miserable so you understand your real place in the spiritual world. <laughs> Out of love for you. Krishna loves you so much, he's making sure that you don't enjoy. Because <laughs> he wants you with him. You understand? It's like the prison should not be a place of enjoyment. 